I mentioned before that this is the 25th anniversary year for the School of Public Policy, and we are excited about our uh, gala event, which we have scheduled at the Reagan Library just over the hill here on February 11th. Our last major event there was actually our 20th anniversary event, which we also hosted at the library. And the keynote speaker that we had for that event was uh, one Senator Ben Sass, who has rightly left, um, you know, a rather toxic Washington to go to the rather calm confines of academia in Gainesville, Florida. I don't know if anybody's seen the reception that <laughs> Senator Sass received in Gainesville, but suffice it to say, if he thought that he was leaving a place of uh, great friction and toxic communications in Washington, D.C., well, he has settled in a new one. But <laughs> it's fair to say that through that event, uh, that 20th anniversary, uh, Senator Sass learned a lot about the policy school and what we were about. And in his uh, first few minutes in talking about uh, why he was excited to be the keynote speaker for the policy school, he talked about this emphasis that we place on the importance of mediating institutions, the importance of uh, faith in shaping not only uh, public policy, but also uh, moral leaders. And he actually at one point called us the Tocqueville School of Public Policy. Now, our speaker uh, for the keynote knows quite a bit about Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville is one of our core texts here at the Policy School. Every student who goes through this program has to have uh, studied, read, and learned from the great Frenchman who came here in the 1830s. This conversation, of course, is only important insofar as it is relevant to today and today's policy issues, which is why uh, this, the title of Dr. Mitchell's talk is Tocqueville and Democracy in Modern America. Uh, Josh is a professor of political theory at Georgetown University. He has been chairman of the government department and also associate dean of faculty affairs at the School of Foreign Service in Qatar. During the 2008 to 10 academic years, he took leave from Georgetown to serve as the acting chancellor of the American University of Iraq, Soleimani. Dr. Mitchell published recently an important book that I would highly recommend for all to read uh, in 2020, titled American Awakening, Identity Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time. I mentioned that Dr. Mitchell in many ways is uh, one of the godfathers of the American project and this focus that we place on communitarianism. Uh, he was here in that first meeting back in uh, 2017 and has regularly been a part of uh, our events and has made numerous contributions in writing and speaking uh, throughout the five years of the American Project, which again is now uh, the Mies Institute for Liberty and the American Project. Uh, Josh has requested uh, for this lecture that we will open it up to questions. And rather than using cards, uh, Dr. Mitchell has recommended a more Tocquevillian approach to this would be to stand up communally, account yourself, and just ask your questions directly. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Josh Mitchell. Uh, we're here because uh, our, our view is that our country is, is quite ill. And in our view is that something like a communitarian return t to Tocqueville's uh, view, uh, which is that mediating institutions alone can save us, is what we have to turn to. Um, in 1989, I was finishing up my PhD, and like so many of us, didn't get a job. <clears throat> and so I stayed at my, at my university and was asked to teach a course on Tocqueville who I'd read fragments of, uh, 
I say that with embarrassment, but I was a political theory major and not read the whole book. And uh, and I read. I went to the library and I sat there for three and a half hours and I read the author's introduction, which is 11 pages long. And I closed the book and I said, well, you're going to spend the rest of your life with this man. And I have. And I, I never, I find more and more in him as I get older. Now, if this were a perfect world, what I would do today is I would, I would proceed to show that this, he was the first, I think, to grasp the importance of mediating institutions. I think part of the reason why people can get away with reading fragments of the book is that there are so many passages which are so exquisite, and you can walk away and say, well, well that's the whole of it. I don't need to worry about the rest. But as a whole, it's just an extraordinary accomplishment. I think it's the greatest book ever written uh, about America, and he calls himself a stranger. And it is the case that the outsiders sometimes see things much more clearly than the insiders. And I think that's a lesson we need to bear in mind. Um, so I would love to sit here and tell you about uh, these grand insights that he has. But my concern is that um, while he was focusing on practical life, and thought that only this invisible reservoir of practical knowledge could save American democracy. Uh, while that's true, uh, we are faced in our own country right now with, um, I think, a, a graver crisis, which is a, a crisis of, let's call it abstract ideas, a crisis on the left and the right. Uh, and what I want to do before I talk to you about Tocqueville is I want to give you my best account of of the pathologies of both the left and the right, which are standing in the way. Uh, Bob will no doubt tell you the story a little bit later on about how uh, the conservative movement at times tapped his insights, uh, and at times has, has grasped this Tocquevillian uh, central insight that it's only mediating institutions that can save us, but the conservative movement has lost its way on many occasions too, and uh, I think what Pete and, and the number of us who gathered together in 2017 hoped then and hope now is that in point of fact, uh, we can help through this organization point in an entirely new, different, new direction or rather return to an old direction which occasionally was walked down but then, but then lost, we lost our way. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a report based on a number of hats that I wear. So I'm a professor at the university. And I'm here to tell you that our students are incredibly frightened. They're incredibly frightened of being canceled, of speaking their mind, of not being woke enough. Uh, they are consumed by concerns for climate change. And I was, I'd be the first to say I'm all for stewardship of the earth. And we're, we have been reckless and irresponsible. But, but their view is that um, they don't even have a right to have children, that that would be irresponsible. They've given up on human generation. Uh, in Washington, D.C., as those of us who live there will attest, the elites of both parties have become disconnected uh, from their fellow citizens. Uh, the left has moved toward identity politics, which I will talk a great deal about here, uh, which I take to be innocent signaling of, of luxury ideas that have little to do with the needs of the middle class and the poor. Uh, on the right, you've got the so-called principled conservatism that gave us free markets and the offshoring of manufacturing jobs, protracted wars abroad, on behalf of democracy for peoples in the Middle East that perhaps didn't want it, and an obliviousness to the least among us. Uh, I do also wear the NatCon hat, some of you know about this, uh, and I think there were some promising developments that occurred. Uh, John Woods and I were in fact on a panel together at that first NatCon movement, or meeting back in December 2016. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is to be juxtaposed, importantly, to what we're doing here. And if I were to put it in a sentence, I would put it this way. I think, and Pete said this well this morning. We're concerned more about the inner, the inner fiber of human connections and the atrophy that has occurred. And while I think we would all agree that healthy patriotism is a great thing, we don't think that should come first, that that comes second, that you get healthy patriotism out of a healthy engagement uh, with your local community. Tocqueville talked about this a great deal. He said there's something called well-considered patriotism, but you don't get love of country unless individual citizens are stakeholders in their local communities. You've got to start from there and then go national. You can't start with some abstract notion of national patriotism. You will go astray. Um, I'm also speaking in some measure uh, as a fellow of the Woodson Center 
where I think some of the best thinking about race in America can be found, especially through the 1776 Unites group, many of which members are, are here today. Um, I also do a lot of lecturing in Europe with something called Common Sense Society, and I will say that what I'm quite concerned about there is developments on the right, blood and soil nationalism is reemerging. Uh, this is something that was purged in the, in the 1920s and 30s, 40s, uh, but it is reemerging and it's very, very troubling. Uh, now, I'm trying to name the experience that we're all having, and I'm, I'm struggling with my words, and I've been struggling for years, and we've been struggling since 2017 to name this thing that's occurring that we, we can't quite find the words for. Uh, I think one way of putting it this, is this way. We're, we're experiencing the disappearance of the middle, of a foundational middle ground in, in at least three senses. First, um, politically, it seems like the left keeps pushing in one direction toward a certain kind of craziness. Uh, could be called the, the false universalism. All, just very briefly, there have been three major left-wing movements since the French Revolution. The French Revolution was one, Marxism is another, and I think this thing called identity politics is a third one. Um, they're all for, to use Marx's language, abolishing the current state of things, and this is movement toward cosmopolitanism, the destruction of local knowledge. This is a very, very serious threat, and it's not clear to me we're going to win. Uh, on the right, on the other hand, you have growing reenchantment movements. Uh, reenchantment is an idea that's been around for a long time. When you step into this liberal world where, where things are broken, where there's suffering, uh, where we don't have easy answers, where life is not parsimonious, there is a great longing to completely re-enchant the world and have all the problems go away. And we're seeing reactionary movements on the right that long to re-enchant the world. So I think politically, we're looking for a middle. We're looking for what I would call the liberal middle. And I don't necessarily mean by that the democratic liberal middle. I mean, there is something called liberal. Uh, and that's what we once had. It's based on a, what I call a politics of competence, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Uh, where we treat each other as legal equals, where we recognize there are differences, where we believe that there's a rule that we have to abide by, but there are exceptions to the rule because a good liberal society will always make exceptions. Uh, we can't find that liberal middle right now. We've got the right peeling off in one direction. We've got the left peeling off in another direction. Socially, we see the disappearance of the mediating institutions, like the families and the churches, civic associations, municipal government, that stand between the lonely, isolated, democratic man and the state. And uh, as I said to you before, Tocqueville is the first one who understands this. And I will add, because it, it is apropos of what Bob is going to talk about um, later on, what Tocqueville grasped and what conservatives must grasp is that what Tocqueville saw was that democracy is held together by this invisible knowledge that can't be rendered in terms of numbers and statistics. It's this invisible repertoire of knowledge you can only gain through face-to-face -face associations. Uh, you know, you can read books on friendship, but you have to know what friendship is. And once you know what friendship is, then you can read and understand those books. Uh, but you have to have developed this, this vast reservoir of invisible knowledge in order for democracy to work. Tocqueville is writing to a French audience. He's not writing for the Americans. He's a Frenchman who comes to America. He's writing to the French, and they're mocking him. They're saying, these silly Americans, they, they have no high culture. Uh, where are their great philosophers? And his response is, that's right. They don't have that. But what they have is citizens engaged in this practical activity of building a world together, which we Europeans cannot find. We have high culture, but we don't have this vast reservoir of knowledge because we don't have local political power and decentralization and federalism, and the Americans believe in that. We also have, finally, a disappearance of the economic middle, uh, bifurcation of society into the, the poor and, and the rich. This is a very serious problem, uh, and I think everyone, conservative or otherwise, who's thinking about America needs to come up with ideas about how we address this. But, as I say, I want to talk about Tocqueville, but I have to talk about the things that stand in the way. And I think one of the biggest ones is what I'm calling the third great revolutionary wave at the moment, this incomplete religion uh, promulgated by the new left. Um, but I want to give it some credit, because here I think conservatives have fallen absolutely flat on their face. What identity politics parishioners, and I do see it as a church, 
what they understand is that, it's, is that people have a deep longing. Something has to fill their souls. And a longing for justice in a broken world is what identity politics promises. I do not think it delivers, but it promises that. And the conservative movement does not promise that. And that's a big problem. Conservatives are thinking about free markets and the importance of tradition. That doesn't touch the depth of the longing that identity politics is naming. And I think it's ultimately, and I will come to this in a second, I'll come to it now, it's a religious crisis. And that's not something we're really talking about. We've talked a bit about the importance of religion as a foundation, but I think we're suffering not only in America, but really in Europe as well, in Christendom as well, uh, with a profound religious crisis. Um, and I don't think it gets solved through politics alone. I think the churches have to do this, and I'll say something about that in a minute. I'll simply add that on the right, we have these other problems, uh, integralism and a flirtation with Nietzsche. If you want to talk about that later, we can, but I don't want to do it now. So I think we have, going forward, two choices. We can either recover something that we, we've never quite had in America, but which we have aspired to, which is what I call a politics of competence. It means we look at each other as bearers of competence. We look at each other with a view to learning how to become competent. We want to be mentors for one another. We want to be apprentices to one another. Uh, to use King's language, it's about the content of your character and how you can build a world together. And the alternative to that is what I'm calling the politics of innocence and transgression, which is identity politics. And there our sole concern when we look at another person is, are you a member of an innocent group who gets a pass, or are you a member of a guilty group who gets no pass? You cannot build a civilization that way. And my view is that we are on the cusp of turning America into that kind of regime. Now, I want to say one more thing about this. I divide American history now into three chapters. <clears throat> the first chapter, I would call, which the founders had, and, and, and Bob has made this very clear, that uh, you, can't get, you can't get limited government that the founders imagined without citizens building a world together in their mediating institutions. So the founders believed in citizen competence, and we need to look everywhere for it and encourage it. The second stage of American history was the stage of expert competence, which is the progressives uh, and I think it's nearly at an end. Even though the left will continue to say, well, we're progressives, I think they're not interested in, in the progressive vision because that was based on expert competence. Not citizen competence, but expert competence. And Jeff Pillay, uh, Paulette, excuse me, uh, has, I think, wonderfully pointed out how once you move in that direction, the state crushes any attempt to revitalize these civic associations. But I think we're on the cusp of a third moment of American history. And that is where the central concern of all our elite institutions is not, and I include the media here, it's not solving problems. It's not competence either in the citizen form or the expert form. It is wholly concerned with identifying so-called innocent victims seemingly siding with them, and, and you will discover that my objection to identity politics is that it actually does immense harm to black America and others who it claims to, to defend. Uh, but, but the problem is that it's simply looking for who's innocent and who's, who's, uh, who's a transgressor. And you can't build a civilization on that, but on that at all. So I think we have those several choices going forward. Um, on the right, and again, I'm going to get to Tocqueville, but I have to talk about the right. On the right, we have impotence, utter impotence. And what I mean by that is that the current right, and this does not include what we're trying to do here, the current right is really a, a, it's a confederation of economic liberals, free market types, and cultural conservatives who want to go back to tradition. And those are wonderful things to be sure. Uh, but, but they do not really include the Tocquevillian vision. That's not its real fault. I think there, there's a lot of optimism that the NatCon movement with Yoram at its head is redressing the balance between the free market libertarians and, and the traditionalists. So as Yoram says, uh, we no longer have the free market veto within conservatism. And I think that's important, but I'm sorry, it doesn't get to the root of the problem in America today because the central problem in America today uh, it, at least in terms of how we're thinking about ourselves, is guilt. Uh, how do we think through the guilt that haunts Americans and haunts Europeans? 
Uh, there's profound, I'll say, guilt in the West. Uh, it lurks in every soul, to be sure. Uh, but Europe, by virtue of, of uh, scientific breakthrough and organizational breakthrough, dominated the world, dominated the world, empire, for three centuries. Um, and now in the age of equality, you've got guilt and remorse and no way to discharge them. And that is a very serious problem. So here's my question to you. What would you do to lift the burden of your guilt? Would you repudiate your nation, your mediating institutions because they're stained, your history? I think we're all being tested here and our very future hangs on the question whether we can recover an understanding of the nature and source of man's guilt and in what atonement consists. Conservatives understand economic debt and the debt we owe to our fathers. These are the cultural conservatives, but they can go no further. I think there's something, there's a bigger debt, it's a bigger guilt that conservat than conservatives even understand that now haunts America. Um, now on the left, as I've said, the, uh, there's, there is this fixation on guilt, on the spiritual economy of debt, on what one group owes to another. In America, this takes form of the conversation and, and the sloganeering around slavery and its aftermath, the unpayable debt which whites owe blacks. I think immense damage is done to this because you get guilty whites who then want to defund the police when it's easy to live, to use Bob's words, in a distant zip code. Uh, a denial of guilt and responsibility among those it deems innocent victims. That does not help anybody. In Europe, it's not just an American problem. In Europe, you've got World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, uh, and there too you've got this sense of unpayable debt which Europe seems to owe the world. I don't see the European Union as an economic union. It's not even an economic union on the way to being a political union. It is a public atonement for two world wars. It is a statement that there will be no more nations in Europe and I have heard, heard elder German statesmen pound the table in front of his European colleagues and say, we will never have nations in Europe again. The weight of guilt which cannot be lifted and you cannot understand the European Union except with respect to that problem. Now when you have a buildup of guilt, you are going to have a buildup of this Nietzschean alt-right thing that people are talking about. I think talking about it p poorly because it did emerge in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it, it's not Richard Spencer, that's nothing, because he's still working with the categories of, of guilt and innocence. He's still working within a Christian framework, he just wants to flip around who the guilty parties are. Now, the, this Nietzschean development, which I don't want to develop here, but it's, he wants to completely get beyond the world of guilt. And so, so Nietzscheans will say of American slavery, of the First World War, of the Second World War, of colonialism, and of the Holocaust, we don't care. Yes, we did this, we don't care, because the Nietzschean position is the only way you can have a tomorrow is if you forget. And I think that would be a tragedy, and I think identity politics is driving a whole generation, especially of young men, who are, are charged with being irredeemably stained. It's driving them into this Nietzschean alternative, and it's driving them into blood and soil nationalism, less so in America, but certainly overseas. So I think we're amidst of, of uh, what I call a, th a third great awakening in America without God and without forgiveness. Everybody's looking for s s uh, to figure out who's stained and who's not. They're looking for ways to find their atonement, but it's not with forgiveness and it's not with God. So we are awakening to fault, sin, and guilt, or rather America and Europe is awakening to fault, sin, and guilt precisely at the moment that Christianity begins to falter. When we saw the water cannons being shot at young black kids in the 1960s, when Europe has to have a reckoning with the Holocaust and with colonialism, and their churches start to wither, they feel the weight of guilt and they have no way out. And identity politics promises a way out. So what's happening in America today, instead of you and I being, becoming very busy trying to figure out how to build competence, how to find those who have competence and support them. Almost every American, every day, is practicing the Passover ritual. Now, the Passover ritual is there to be found in Exodus. 
uh, what, it, what occurs is God says, listen, death is going to pass you by if you put the blood of an innocent lamb on your lintel. Every single day in America, people are doing a variant of that. They are putting, this office is green, black lives matter, we're for climate change, we're, we're against whatever the phrase is, we want, we're for green energy. Everybody is putting some sign on their front yard that absolves them of social death so they will not be canceled. Does this solve problems? No, it does not. Does it appease white guilt? Yes, it does. And we have this profound problem. If we're going to build a world of competence, which is the world that Tocqueville thought we needed to have, we cannot be looking at each other and asking, are you a sinner? Are you pure? Is what you're standing up for a matter of purity or stain? Do you believe in dirty fossil fuels, clean green energy? This, this religious terminology is penetrating all of our culture, and it's making it impossible for us to actually build a world together. That is why I think conservative talking points like right to life, Second Amendment, religious liberty, lower taxes, and even the, the talk about CRT, which has become a fundraising uh, strategy, uh, it will do nothing. Because what the right doesn't understand is that America is consumed by guilt, and the left knows how to play this. Now, I want to talk about identity just for a couple minutes. If you mean by identity kind, I don't have a problem with that. So my father's family came from Lebanon. I am partly Lebanese. Uh, so my identity is Lebanese. Not troubled by that. But that's not how it has currency in America today. It's not identity as kind. It's identity as relationship. And here I mean a relationship between a transgressor and an innocent victim, between stain and purity. And so everybody aligns themselves and establishes their moral worth on the basis of their innocence category, on the basis of their innocence status with respect to the prime transgressor. And you can go look up your intersectional scorecard if you want on the internet. You can find out how many innocence points you have. And this is the new moral economy. And I will say, I say this somewhat provocatively, in a way it's the flip side of Reaganism. And let me explain why. With Reaganism, the idea was that market efficiency was the only thing we needed in order to figure out how to live well. So we got a single measure, it's an easy measure. And I'm saying identity politics is an easy measure. You just figure out where you are on the intersectional scorecard and the farther are you down, you are down, the more you have the right to speak and the others don't have a right to speak. You cannot build a world on this. Now here's the problem. Uh, I, innocence and, and transgression, these are theological categories. Even the word pollution, before it was taken up by the climate movement, uh, it's a theological word. Pollution pertains to internal stain. It's not, it's not fossil fuels or carbon dioxide. And the Christian understanding is the one that identity politics is, is a heresy of, and I've increasingly used the word heresy. So what I'm saying is identity politics is a deep deformation of Christianity. And to explain why that's so, I need to just make a couple of distinctions here. So the central categories in identity politics are the scapegoat, the ones who get canceled, uh, the innocent victim, and irredeemable stain. Now, some of you in this room know your Bible and know that those categories do in fact exist in the Bible, those three categories. They're central to Christianity, in fact. But what has happened is that what, was a, what is a vertical relationship in Christianity becomes a horizontal relationship in identity politics. So, in Christianity, there is an irredeemable stain. All of us suffer from it. It's called original sin. There is indeed an innocent victim, one innocent victim, who takes away the sins of the world. He is the scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. And the Christian understanding, which I don't think we fully grasped after 2,000 years, is that the problem of sin is so deep that you cannot solve it in the way the pagans did it, in the way that identity politics now does it, which is to say, you over there in that group, you're the source of the stain, I'm gonna purge you, and when you're purged, I can feel pure. That's how the pagans did it. 
that's how identity politics is returning to it. And the fantastic insight that Christianity had, which if you really understood it, you'd have goosebumps up and down your body, is the problem of sin is so deep, you can't purge that other group. You can't pick out that other group and say, if we can just get rid of that group, everything's going to be fine. You can't do it because it's always already inside you. And no matter what violence you do to another group, you can't become pure by scapegoating them and purging them from the community. That we are returning as we fall away from Christianity to this pagan understanding that in fact you can scapegoat other groups and we can purge them and everything will be fine. Um, so we've turned it, I say it again, into a, a horizontal relationship, whereas instead of looking upward to solve our problem, we look outward to solve our problem. And we say if we can just scapegoat that group out there, everything will be fine. And here's the problem with that. In the Christian formulation, you have one sufficient scapegoat who for one time and for all of time takes away the sins of the world, and that's done. Halas, as they say in Arabic. But with identity politics, that's not how it works. What happens is first you have one prime transgressor, and right now it's the white guy. But it doesn't stop there, and it can't stop there, because once you purge him, once you send him off into pornography, once you have him give up, which is what's happening to a whole generation of men, black and white, once you purge them, you've got to have another scapegoat. And sooner or later, as people on the left are discovering, you were once an innocent victim, but, but now you're a transgressor. And to press the matter as far as I can, and I realize this is very controversial, but I'm, I'm too old not to say controversial things, uh, I, I do worry that what's happening with the movement towards transgenderism is that we're, we're accusing people who, who believe in, let's call it the heteronormative family, or at least the family, let's, let's press this back one step, that believes men are men and women are women, uh, or, or the church, what you're ending up doing to, to be inclusive, and I did like Jeff's comment about the difference between a real community and a sham community, uh, what you're doing to be inclusive is you're saying every, anyone who believes in the traditional family or the traditional church is now guilty of a thought crime. Now how can that be, really? Can that really be the case? And I think especially in, in the case of, of black America, which uh, by virtue of, uh, of being, having the state against it for so long, to use the language of Theta Scotchpool, became an incredible group, group of joiners. Meaning that the Tocquevillian insight that we have to join together was especially true historically for blacks after the Civil War because the state was against them. And so Martin Luther King will say in the 1950s and 60s, uh, yeah, we want the state to supplement what we're doing here, but we know that it's through the churches and through the families that the black community has survived. So wait a minute, so, so now we're getting to the point where black America, which was seen as the, the first in a long line of, of uh, using the language of victimhood, once, once you get down far enough away from them in the transgender movement, or at least certain wings of it, I'm not gonna say it's unified, but what happens is then the institutions that the least among us need the churches and the families, now become guilty of, of thought crimes. Can that be really the case? Can it be that once an innocent victim n now becomes a transgressor? I mean, these are titanic battles, and I don't wish to take a stand on it, but I do wish to indicate that once you start down this identity politics road of scapegoating one group after another, it turns out that the, the first innocent victim eventually becomes a transgressor, and you keep going farther and farther and farther out. So you, can't, you can never be sure that you're an innocent victim with identity politics. I tell my, tell my kids at Georgetown, all of whom are, are quite righteous about the stains of the past, I say, hmm, I see, you're, I see you're sipping from a plastic water bottle. Now it's gonna turn out probably that plastic pollution is gonna be the thing that's gonna really harm us by the 21st century. It's getting, microplastics are getting into the biological food chain. We're gonna have really serious problems with that. And I say to them, so if 50 years from now, the fact, everything you did uh, is going to be erased by virtue of the fact that you drank water from a plastic water bottle. It just, it never ends. It can never end. That's why I think that the, the proper way to think through innocence and transgression has got to be theological. And only if we do think through it theologically uh, 
can we have this wondrous thing that we're all really struggling to make, which is the ability to look at each other not as a way of solving my problem of internal stain, not as a scapegoat who can make me feel better, but, but instead we can look at each other as fellow citizens who are going to build a world together with this invisible knowledge that has nothing to do with purity and stain. So uh, we, we have to move in that direction, uh, and I do think Tocqueville is the one, if I can just come to this for a little bit, because the whole conference is on Tocqueville. Um, I just want to tell you his general theory. So in 1835, he comes to democracy in America, uh, and, and he, he writes the first volume, which is fairly upbeat, and the second volume is deeply despairing, because he, he worries about the exact same things we're worrying about right now, namely that there's some kind of internal logic which makes us slowly erase all the mediating institutions that we need to have. The state's going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And his general theory, you should just know this, is we're moving from the aristocratic age to the democratic age. In the aristocratic age, you have the one, the few, and the many. The king, the nobles, and the rest of us. In the democratic age, you've got the state, you've got the citizens, and then you have a gigantic question mark right here in the middle. And his point is, you have two choices, gang. You're in the democratic age. You can't go back. You can't re-enchant the world. You have two choices. You can either let all these middle layer institutions, these mediating institutions that stand between the state and the individual, as the nobles once stood between the king and the commoners. You can either fortify these and work every single day with your neighbors to build a world around liberty, or equality will come. But it won't be equality and liberty. It will be equality and servitude at the end of history where you've got a kinder, gentler despotism, a state that looks after every one of your needs in the name of helping. We have to be very clear. In the name of helping, we're going to undermine all these mediating institutions that once brought democratic liberty. That's his view. And so we have to, we have to ask the question, what is it that we're finding in these mediating institutions? And I think, first and foremost, and I've used this word a number of times, Competence, citizen competence. It's not something you can measure. So yes, I am an academic, but I put myself through school as a carpenter. I've done boat building. I've been a musician on the road, and I've built universities. I am not an academic. I do that. That's my second job. I'm actually restoring a farmhouse. That's what I do. Now, I have sat at the feet of a number of really, really fine carpenters and boat builders, and I've said, how, what, what do you do? What is that that you're doing? And they'll say, they'll say things like, well, you can watch, but I can't tell you exactly what this is. This is invisible here. And anyone who has sat at the feet of a master knows that that's how it really works. There's only so much you can convey. But in these mediating institutions, we can sit in relationship of apprenticeship and mentor, and we can help people. And it's not something the social scientists can measure. It's something that you and I can have and be proud of and develop a competence in and convey and hand on to the next generation. And that is our task if we want to save democratic liberty. We also learn in this strange age of equality, we learn how to rule and be ruled in every group, whether it's in your family, in your churches. We have to learn how to rule and be ruled. And sometimes you need to step up and sometimes you need to step back. And you can't learn that in a textbook. You have to learn that in face-to-face -face relations. You also can't learn trust from a textbook. The only way you can learn trust is by extending it to others and having it work out and having it be reciprocated. We have to learn certain kinds of character and habits. That's where those are formed. And then more, most importantly of all, we discover who we are. And I think one of the great failings of identity politics is it gives us an easy out. Oh, I'm Lebanese. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. Well, okay, you can start a conversation that way, and I can go to a Lebanese home, and we can, we can have foods together, and, and that's great, but it's only going to go so far. Yeah. What Tocqueville thought was that through these face-to-face -face associations, that's where we discover who we are. Why? Because the person we meet always exceeds what we expect. And that is why he was able to say, feelings and ideas are renewed, the heart enlarged, and the mind expanded only by the reciprocal actions of men one upon another. It's only in this face-to-face -face association that we can, in his words, unleash an energy never before seen in human civilization. Only 
in these relations. And conservatives have been oblivious to them. We've got policy about free markets. We have grand aspirations for, for democracy exportation abroad. We have forgotten this fundamental Tocquevillian insight that it's only through face-to-face -face associations that we can be saved from the despotism at the end of history. Tocqueville says at one place, um, a tyrant will forgive citizens for not loving him, provided they do not love each other. The best guarantee of tyranny is when we don't love each other. The only uh, 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 way we can avoid tyranny is if we build these constant fortifications. There's one other thing I want to say, and then we can open it up. Uh, because we've been talking about loneliness, but I want to want to put it put a pe peculiar Tocquevillian slant on this. So, in the 20th century, late 20th century, we have these two words, which are largely interchangeable: bipolarity and bipolar disorder and manic depression. What I'm here to tell you is, in 1840, in the second volume, uh, Tocqueville wrote, "I foresee a day when citizens will come to think of themselves as greater than kings and." less than men. Now what did he mean? He thought that as we broke the ties that held us together, our souls would start swinging. We would, on the one hand, feel that we're greater than kings. Why? Because nobody can stop us. We have no accountability to anybody. This is what I call selfie man. This is Facebook and Instagram man. Okay. This is, I am sovereign of my own a digital domain. But he didn't just stop with that. He said greater than kings and less than men. And what he meant by this was when we're completely alone, we feel isolated and we will fall into despair. He thought depression was going to be the central problem in the democratic age. He says, I believe in democratic America in the future, there will be more madness than any place ever in human history. And he did mean this oscillation back and forth between feeling yourself greater than kings or less than men, which is manic depression. On his view, this is not a brain chemistry problem. This is a problem of human relations. And so the only possible way we can attenuate that problem, I did not say solve it, because to be human is to be unstable. But the only way we can make it less bad, forgive my language, the only way we can make it less bad is by having never ending face-to-face -face associations with one another to pull ourselves out of the despair. And all of us should pay attention to those sorts of relations which pull us out of ourselves and do everything we can to support them. I'll stop with that. Questions? Please. I'm going to try and be brief on this because it's actually a huge question. And I'm just going to, the question, the question is, OK, but now money controls everything. Money is the single measure. And, and so I'm, I'm going to do a very brief, bear with me, Marx and Tocqueville. Okay? Because Marx was the first one, actually after Tocqueville, in 1848 in the Communist Manifesto. He says, what characterizes this new situation that we're in, called, he calls it capitalism. Adam Smith does not call it that. But what, what characterizes this new moment that we're in is that everything is reducible to a price. And Marx said, nothing can battle for that, and against that for long. National particularities, localism, nothing can battle for that. So we're thrown into this, uh, this, this historical necessity. Now Marx thought that at the end of history we would we'd finally overcome that and become fully human. Okay. Now, because communism is the revolution which finally brings us to full humanity. Prior to that, in capitalism, we have one single measure, and it's money. And that's it. Now, interestingly enough, before Marx wrote that in 1848, Tocqueville wrote it in 1840. 
in one passage in Democracy in America, he says, I foresee a time when money really become, will become one of the most important things. But he never thought it would become the, the, most, the only thing, and I'll tell you why. He didn't believe in historical necessity. This is, bear with me, I'm, this is, I know it's right after lunch, but this is really, really important. Here's the question, is life plural or can life be made singular? And in an appendix, in the, I think the best appendix in democracy in America, he says this, um, man's idea of unity is always sterile, God's idea is infinitely plural. And what he means by this is that we're gonna come up with these cockamamie schemes to try to re reduce everything to one thing, namely money. He saw this, Tocqueville saw this was necessarily gonna happen. But what Tocqueville says is, is this, we, we human beings actually know that while money is really important, it's not all. We know this in our bones. Now, are we gonna try to make it all? Yeah, we're gonna teach, we're gonna tell students that they're consumers not students. We're going to render everything in terms of an economic metaphor. But what Tocqueville is saying is that actually life can't be that way and that life, and it comes to what I said earlier, is not parsimonious. That we know we owe some debt to the market, but if we keep going in that direction only, we get to exactly the situation where we are now, where, where we know that there's this other value called family and community which can't be reduced to monetary price. And what he worried about, what Tocqueville worried about, what Marx thought was inevitable, which what Tocqueville worried about was that instead of you and I being wise citizens who recognize that life doesn't fit and there's all these different competing things, all of which are important, we're going to succumb to the idea that money is the single measure. It shouldn't be that way. And we're gonna look for a cheap way out. That's what I mentioned, that's why I mentioned Reaganism in the, in the 1980s. The idea that economic efficiency is the only measure, that's, that's a Marxist idea. We have to be very clear on this. And so we're always looking for cheap ways to understand ourselves and each other, simple ways which don't run into conflict. And, and let me just finish with this. The problem with identity politics is it gives you a cheap way of saying, well, I'm just this. I'm this and I stand in relationship to you this way. But when you meet each other in face-to-face -face relations, what you discover very quickly is, well, you might have thought that. But at the end of a real conversation, not a scripted one, a real conversation, you go away thinking, well, I thought that person was this, but..." They're not that, and I thought I was this, but maybe I'm not that either. And so Tocqueville thought that only in face-to-face -face associations do we learn this fundamental insight that life can't be reduced to a simple system. That in engagement, it, what we discover always exceeds what we thought going in, and that's how you renew a civilization. So the money is a big thing, but Tocqueville refuses Marx's fatalism. We all have a choice every single day. Yes, we have to earn a living, make no mistake about it, but in how we organize our families and where we live, we can make these hard choices, and they are hard choices. But life doesn't fit in the democratic age. It's not parsimonious, but that's the moral burden we bear. There's always going to be suffering. There's always gonna be incompleteness, and we can't use that as an argument against the life that we've had. There's always gonna be suffering, there's always gonna be violence. We have to, like Adam and Eve, who were evicted from the garden, recognize that we are now stewards and we got a broken garden but we got to till it and we're not going to throw away the garden and i think america is this garden this incredible place incredibly tumultuous violent but also beautiful history and we have to own it all and say the burden of our suffering is not an argument against life we are going to proceed in hope because we got a country to build please when you're talking about Marx and that nobody will nobody will fight because everything has has a price, it reminded me of um, Nathaniel Hawthorne has a short a short reflection called Fire Worship, where he talks about the abolition of fire, the heart and replaced being replaced by the stove, which is much more sort of cold and impersonal. People can be in different rooms; they don't all have to gather together. And in a way, he's framing it as nature versus convention. And I wonder if, I w I'm curious what you think about the question of the return to nature as a way to think about what we're saying here. This question of community and family and the, the natural mediating institutions. I know yeah. that's not Tocqueville's language, but do you think it's a helpful way to frame it? So let me ask you, uh, this question is, what about a return to nature? Is that a helpful way to frame it? Let me, let me pose the question to you. Is this a kind of enchanted view? 
that nature is enchantment. I want to be, so Tocqueville, just very quickly, I, I'm very worried about enchantment movements. And, and, and the subtext of that, or the, the corollary to that, is I'm very worried about a conservative movement that will talk about the virtues of family, but the, ver the family they have in mind is the one that's completely intact, the kind of enchanted family. And, and, and my view is, well, OK, that's great, but I don't know how many people who have that, honestly. And it, it seems to me much more constructive to recognize that we, we can't go, there's no re-enchantment of the world possible. And this is Tocqueville's great virtue, because he saw his European friends facing democracy and wanting to go back to an aristocratic past. And we saw what happened in the 20th century with re-enchantment movements. Tocqueville will have nothing to do with re-enchantment movements. So he knows that the whole thing is broken in the first place. He knows that, our, look, he says voluntary associations are the key. But what does that mean? That means the world we had was ripped apart. The world where we had a, we were, had a place in the hierarchy, we had roles and relations, and we had what I call an economy of obligation and loyalty as opposed to an economy of, of money, that has been ripped apart from us. And so now what we have to do is rebuild from a condition of being fragmented. And so I think that's why, to come to Pete's I think, central, central thesis, we start from the fact of that we don't have these enchanted families, we don't have these perfect institutions, but they are gifts through which we can gather together and build something, build, build toward hope, recognizing that all of these institutions are broken, that families are broken, and yet still we, we hang on to the hope that through them many can be redeemed and then we try to have a net underneath, not necessarily for the state, but a social net underneath for the people who are broken. So I don't want to, I don't want to even start from the conservative presupposition that there was once a hallowed time where everything held together. I think if you're, I think if it's, if you're Christian, I don't think you can do that at all because you start from Adam and then there was the murder, the first murder in the first family. I mean, it's, it's been broken. So I start in a way from a very Calvinistic position, which is that it's pretty poisonous right from the beginning and, and then we've got these gifts that we can use to build together. And so let's do that. And so Tocqueville is not presenting a picture of perfection. This is one thing I think we must understand. It's a, it's a picture where things don't fit. He says this entire book has been written under a kind of religious dread. Now what he means is we once, we aristocrats, we French aristocrats, once believed that the world was coherent and whole and God gave us clear signals. Going forward, there are no clear signals. We're struggling in the darkness. And, and we have to recognize that that's forever the way it's going to be. And that's why, amidst that struggle, we have to recognize how precious these mediating institutions are and what can be formed in them, which is a kind of competence in the face of suffering and adversity to build a world together, to be stewards of the earth. I take very seriously, I'll say it a second time, I take very seriously what happens after the fall. So let's admit that the world is broken and stained and corrupt and racist and everything else. Yes. Now, now what do they do after they get evicted? They build the world. OK, got it. Yeah, it's broken. Now let's repair. And I think that's the piece. Conservatives are basically frightened to start from the supposition that it's broken. Quickly, I think the, 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 there was a strange dance done between the 1619 Project folks and, and conservatives. And I'll, I'm proud to say that I think the 1776 group found a third way. So what was the dance? Hannah Nicole Jones says, America is irredeemably stained. It's stained from the very beginning. Conservatives jump in and say, no, it's not. The founding was pure. They're both holding the same supposition. Namely, if something is stained, it's not worth sustaining. They're holding the exact same supposition. Whereas I think the 1776 group said, we're not with you on the conservative point. It wasn't, it wasn't beautiful, only beautiful. It had beautiful aspects, but it was still broken. It, but, but being broken is not an argument against proceeding. Yeah, yeah. That's what we have to understand here. And, and the conservatives are not seeing that. They're just not. So uh, th I think we have to start over from recognizing that we, we start from brokenness, and now let's build together, and that allows us to recognize the fragility and the importance of all these mediating institutions. Please.
younger people, yes, they're terrified of being canceled. Yeah. And they're terrified of things in their mind right now. So you're saying go back and mediate the institutions and people, and if you're younger, particularly you're like, this is not in my interest to go back into a group again, get canceled, lose my career. I just need yeah. to keep my head down, my mouth shut, and keep a job and keep quiet. Yeah, it's a great so point. How do you recommend so let me, let me put the, the problem this way. So the way Tocqueville formulates it is we need all these mediating institutions and, Christ, and religion, but he's thinking largely of Christianity as one of them. He's talking about you know, North America. So, but here's the question. Is it, is it just one among mediating institutions or is it in a way the most important? Now, I characterized this new movement and you've, you've highlighted it as, as a great awakening without God and without forgiveness. It's the forgiveness part. Right, so what I find most troubling at Georgetown is that all the conversations are scripted about race, about the relations between the sexes. It's totally scripted. Everybody knows the script. Everybody says the right thing, and they go back. They they leave, and they say, "Phew, wow, don't have to do that anymore." Right, and, but the but the what we should do is look. This is a tumultuous nation. We have wounds. We have misunderstandings. We have different groups who who aren't gonna completely agree with one another. And my view is, yeah, that's America. That's exactly right. And we need to have the ability to, to say things and, and recognize that we're going to overstep. Sometimes we're going to say things wrongly. Sometimes we're going to say things in a way that hurt people. My view is that's human relations. That's just how it goes. And the question, the measure of a man, in my view, is never what you do. It's what you do after you make a mess. That's, it's what you do to fix what you just did. Yeah. That's the measure of a person. Yeah. And so what, what I think the young people don't have is this understanding that, here I'll be Christian for a second, to be human is to turn toward darkness. I mean, Adam was given the grant to turn toward nothing, to turn toward blackness, or to, to, toward evil. He was given that grant. And human beings are always gonna turn toward darkness. Yeah. Uh, but that's not the final word because God's goodness always supervenes over, over that darkness. But if, you, but if you lose that insight, then what happens is you get so scared to say anything. And as I said with respect to both Americans and Europeans, uh, the, the burden of guilt is getting higher and higher and higher. And so young people now are frightened, you've said it Rich, they're frightened to death to say anything. And the question is, how then do you discharge the guilt? I'm telling you how identity politics is telling us we can do it. Come unto me, all you are weary, and I will give you rest. Renounce your nations. Renounce your families. Renounce all the history that you have, your monuments and everything. I, for one, do not believe those man, many, all those monuments should be removed. They should be remembered because that shows the further agony after the Civil War of a problem that was not solved. And that we need to tell our grandchildren about, that it wasn't resolved. You can't erase the history of the agony. You need to be able to say, that's what it was, that's what we either are fighting against or, or now we're victorious over it. And, and what hap the left wants to, the young kids in the left, they, they're scared to death to live in an impure world. And that's the big change that has to happen. And I don't think that can happen through any of the other mediating institutions except for most people in America, Christianity. I recognize Judaism and Islam, I recognize very serious contingents there, but I'm saying this is really a Christian problem. And I think, just to press this, I think this happened because in the 20th century, all the Christian churches went soft. And they started talking about God's love but not his judgment. And when they started, when they stopped talking about God's judgment, people still needed a way to think through their sin and it left the churches and it came out into politics as identity politics. And so now people say, I know how to understand my sin. It's, I've got, this is my intersectional score, I'm a transgressor, I owe these kinds of debt points, as all I have to do is put Black Lives Matter sign in my front yard and I'm absolved as a white person. This is twisted, this is really twisted. So what has to happen is we, we have to recover, I think ultimately a theological ground for, for understanding that we are going to make mistakes and yet, even when we do, there's divine hands that lift us up, and through forgiveness, which isn't human, it's, div it's divine, through forgiveness, we can then march forward. But only through that, and if you lose that, and you still keep the guilt, you lose the forgiveness, you still keep the guilt, 
you will succumb to identity politics because sooner or later you're going to say the guilt is so much, I'm just giving up. So I'm, I'm going to route America. This is the 1619 Project. America is systemically racist. And the implications of that very quickly are either complete despair, which is terrible, or politically, uh, only the state can save you. Ever more state programs because you by yourself, you with your friends, you with your neighbors, you with your family, you with your local community, you with your churches, you can't help yourself because it's systemic. This is a recipe for despair. You can't do this. So I think unless we regain a theological grasp that human beings are always going to make mistakes and yet it's not the final word and our young kids have none of this, until that happens, people are going to be scared to death to say anything. And we'll have tyrants telling us what we need to renounce in order to buy absolution. Please. Well, I think what happened, I'm speaking out of turn, but I'm going to speak anyway, okay? Uh, uh, I think what happened in the 60s was, okay, I came out of University of Chicago, so it's Leon Cass and others. And I'll, I'll tell you the Leon Cass story. So Leon Cass is driving, Leon Cass is, uh, shall we say, one of the greatest living Jewish philosophers? Okay. Very old now, but um, in the 1960s, a lot of Jews were moving toward Reformed reform Judaism. And, and what happened was when their kids, so Leon was driving his daughter Sarah to Boston, and he says to her, so where do you live? And he's expecting, well, I'll go find where the Jewish community is. And, you know. and she said, well, I'll just find some place. And one thing led to another, and it became clear that the daughter really had no interest in, in living in a, or in a Jewish community. And a lot of Reformed Jews said, well, this is a recipe for disaster. And so I think a lot have turned to orthodoxy as a coherent system. This allows me to speak, by the way, to, to the issue of groups in America. I'm going to steal something from Bob. He won't mind. Um, so I, we call ourselves liberal, and we see this anomic development all around us where things are being pulled apart. But we still are members of a group. So my father's family came over from uh, southern Lebanon in 1890. There are still my Lebanese family members, some of them speaking eight, 1890s Lebanese Arabic dialect in Worcester, Massachusetts. No, Orthodox, Antioch, before the Catholics. I'm going to say that right now. Um, so, um, so, uh, so here's the question. So how should we think about groups in America? And the phrase I use, I haven't used it enough, but I'll use it here, just enough liberalism. By which I mean, we need to live with a recognition that we all have legal equality and we want to build a regime toward legal equality. But the idea that we have to have total integration in order to be American, that's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. And, and why it is, it's expected that black America is supposed to integrate, but we don't ask this of Chinese Americans, Lebanese Americans, Mexican Americans. I mean, this is just preposterous. So, so here, I'll steal Bob's phrase. The opposite of, of segregation is not integration, it's desegregation, meaning you don't want to have laws which force people to live together, but if they choose to live together, nothing wrong with that. This country has just enough liberalism, it's just enough of the legal protections, but look, we're, we're a country where all these groups still gather together. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So Orthodox community, uh, the largest black middle class in America, Prince George County, nothing wrong with that. And we should stop thinking that to be liberal means we have to be completely integrated. I still, I mean, my father chose to leave in the 1940s, but the relatives are still there and all the cousins, and they're still tus tusking, you know, why did you leave the home? You know, all the, you know how this goes. But there's nothing wrong with living together in groups. It's just we can't have laws that say you have to. That's just enough liberalism. That's, the, that's, I think, what we need to aim for. And I think, I think you know, we talk about media and the institutions, that's important. But I think we should also recognize as part of this new movement, there's nothing wrong with groups gathering together. They just can't be forced to live together. Got it? So we have to be comfortable with the fact that we're not, we're, we're also members of groups. And, and not just voluntary ones, but ones that have to do with deeper forces within us. And that's fine. Yeah, that's 
please. So I'm aware of the concept, and my two comments about stewardship were directed in exactly that direction, is that I think w w the, health, the healthy and responsible way to proceed is not by having delusions that America is pure or that any people's history is pure. I think we should start with the recognition that what happened there in the garden was, what it was cataclysmic, and, and, and then something was asked of them which is they have to go out and be stewards of the earth and build the earth and reheal it. And I, so I, I was somewhat critical of the climate change movement. I'm very critical of the environmental movement too, but I, I'll tell you why. Because I think what it does is that it distances human beings from the environment. It says, well, the environment. It, it says that has to be protected. You are a stain, we're gonna keep you from it. Stewardship is, no, you're already in it. And so when I, you know, I, I'm out in the eastern shore heating with a wood stove. I have to figure out how many trees I'm gonna cut down. How warm do you need to be, Mitchell, this winter? And I think stewardship is always this, always already in nature relationship. And my argument is the way you destroy reverence for nature is to keep up with environmentalism because unless you've got active hands-on engagement with nature, you're not gonna love it. Just as you're not gonna love your country unless you have active engagement through your local community, you can't. We have to be engaged and what we're building is a world where human beings are distanced from it, where we are the cancer and we're just gonna try and save nature. This is deeply sick. So, so re help, healing the earth is not identifying ourselves as a cancer and the earth is pure. No, it's recognizing that we're, we're in God's creation and we have to work with it. Knowing that we're broken, knowing that we're gonna make mistakes, nature is probably fecund and forgiving enough so that we can recover, she can recover.